described by some as the Abraham Lincoln of the Bahamas and by others as the Bahamian Marcus Garvey, this businessman, philanthropist, and civic activist, along with people like the late Charles Rodriguez, Edgar Bain, Dr. C.R. Walker, Clarence Bain, and Maxwell Thompson, fought for the Bahamas that we today enjoy. In paying tribute to Samilo in 1973, the late Sir Lyndon Oscar Pilling had this to say. In the 37 years in which Sir Milo Butler has colored the politics of the Bahamas, he has moved from the lonely voice crying in the wilderness against the oppression and injustices inflicted by a minority upon a majority to the high office of Governor General in an independent Bahamas. Many of our senior citizens recall with fondness the generosity and the compassion of the man MB as he moved through the hospital wards, distributing his own money to help those less fortunate than himself. May recall his success in business, carved out against many adversities with sheer hard work and human industry. Many of our not-so-senior citizens recall the iron will, resolve, and determination of Samilo, demonstrated when he went to the office of the then colonial secretary demanding the discharge of two men wrongly and cruelly imprisoned. And we all recall 1956, when this champion of the people joined hands with a group of men, most of them many years his junior. Together, these men faced the electorate for the first time as a reforming political party. I remember, too, the general strike of 1958. Samilo, while determined that the taxicab union get a fair decision from the ruling oligarchy, he was level-headed enough still to counsel and advise that unity lay in numbers and that victory lay in peaceful but forceful demonstration. Whenever there was a call for justice, and wherever there was a fight for the freedom and dignity of man to live and work with equal pay and decent conditions in this country, Sir Milo Butler was there. Bramah Road, 1942. The General Strike, 1958. Black Tuesday, 1965. January 10th, 1967. And July 10th, 1973. These are all part of the history of the struggle for freedom in the modern Bahamas. And on each occasion, Sir Milo was there. He is a humble but wise man, a compassionate but determined man, a good and a great man. The nation has afforded him the highest seat in the land. It was the least it could do. I am sure that he will continue the work he so ably began long before I was born. Work that will continue to affect the days, the times, and the generations beyond tomorrow. But who was this man? And what made him different? What were the values that governed his life? What were the things that he held dear? How can we take a page from his life, not only to improve ourselves, but also to help improve the quality of life for our fellow men? This one-hour documentary examines the life of a man who, though large in stature, was a friend to the small man, though considered wealthy, was kind to the poor, and though powerful, a humble soul. Milo Bowton Butler, affectionately known to his friends as M.B., was born on the 11th of August, 1906, to the late George and Francis Butler. He was the third of ten children and the only son to survive. His father died when Milo was only 14 years old, and so he was forced to leave school to care for his mother and seven sisters. During the Great Depression, of the 1920s times were hard in the bahamas and like many other families the butler family relocated to the united states of america they settled in a place called hastings florida here 
young Milo continued to develop his entrepreneurial skills by working odd jobs, which included door-to-door -door trading, as well as serving as a cook in different hotels and restaurants. His role as provider for his family started at an early age. In the early days of my mother's life, she had lost her father and Milo, as the only son, took charge of the family, literally brought his sisters up. He himself went off to Florida in search of work. And while there, he brought the family, all of his sisters and his mother to Florida, where he cared for them. I know my mum would tell me often about sandwiches and steaks that were specially cooked by him because he had been working in a restaurant and brought for them. So to a great extent, they became citizens of both countries. The Butler family returned to Nassau in 1927. And on October 14th, 1928, Sir Milo married a beautiful Long Island girl, Caroline Loretta Watson. She became his lifelong friend and partner. This union, like that of his parents, George and Francis, produced 10 children. Together, they taught their children the value of hard work and the same religious values that were instilled in him as a youngster. And the children knew that Milo and Caroline were a team. The two sets of children in the Butler family, the older set, beginning with Edna, Riley, Emmy, uh, Joseph, and Nita. They were the older ones. And then the younger group started with Milo Jr., Milo, Frank, Issa, Basil, Matthew, and, and myself. And so we would, Milo would be like the big brother, and, and he would control things, and, and we would watch uh, movies on, on, on uh, Sunday evenings, you know. And I could remember these Charlie McCartney movies and, and this, uh, what they call still movies, no sound. And with the writing, for those of us who just learning to read, the older boys would have to read what, 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 what was on the screen. But, I, but those, those were good days. He made me um, realize that I had to learn how to work and um, work was something that fills your life it, it, it was an integral part of, of your life and um, he always threw out to all of us the devil will find work for idle hands to do and so I'm going to find good work for you to do he always had sheep and goats and chickens and cows and you name it and we were supposed to be taking care of those and we know that that was a regular chore that you had to do and sometimes we were trying to be like we were ducking and we were supposed to make sure that all these creatures were watered and fed every day and so you knew when you came home from school you were supposed to make sure nobody should have to tell you to make sure that the animals had water. Even though we were boys, we had to do, uh, to do a lot of scrubbing, particularly in the shop and whatnot. So we used to dread, I used to hate to know when the weekend comes because you had to scrub the shop. And my brother just before me, Milo, and I particularly were at one stage again, were tied to doing that. Now, because he was kind of speedy and good, you know, so if I say speedy and good, he could scrub fast and clean. <laughs> so he'd be finished long before I finished, and you really want to get out of there so fast to go do something else if you could sneak up, but you know you got to do that, you can't do that. Later on, we developed into the situation where we had to go and do ice delivery. So that was another chore as we got older. And you're getting up at 4, 4.30 in the morning to be to the ice house so that you can be the first person, the first truck on the line because you got to get your ice, go out and deliver it, and 
be finished in time to get to school. The ice thing was every day, every morning, every morning, seven days a week, 365 days a year, morning before school and evening after school. And of course, we had other things to do, like trying to assist with cleaning the house. So we, everybody had their fair share of the load to carry. Christmas time was the happiest time because that's when Santa Claus came. And usually you didn't get what you actually wrote to Santa Claus for. Um, my, my, my parents were not into the toys and that sort of thing. You, you, we got dolls as girls, the boys got little trucks and so on, but they basically gave you things they felt you needed and books were very high in that. But these were things that you learned to appreciate. Christmas Christmas was the best time of the time when there was a lot of food around, a lot of people around, and it was the time when we were allowed to have a drink, a wine. <laughs> <laughs> and we all looked forward to that. My daddy had a ritual, and um, he would um, line us up after Christmas dinner. And um, we were lined up in the order in which we were born. My oldest sister first, right, going right down the line. Only the baby didn't get it. The baby was too young at the time, but when the baby started to walk, we all got a little wine glass of wine. We as children could not go and say... Um, Daddy, can we go to such and such a place and get an answer from him? He would say, I'm sorry, you'll have to ask your mother. And we'll go, um, Mama, Daddy sent us to ask you if we could go to such and such a movies like on a Friday afternoon. And she will say, ask your father. But we asked him and he sent him to you. Well, I think you better go ask him again. Daddy, Mama said, we should come and ask you again. Well, tell her if she says, if she allows you to go, I might be able to give you the money. So we go back to her. And she'll say, well, if he said you could go, you could go. <laughs> but it was that sort of thing. And decisions about us were as far as I can remember, never made unless both of them agreed. It was some, it, they, they were just together as far as we were concerned. In addition to rearing a family, this couple also started a family business, Milo Butler and Sons, which has grown into a successful family operated organization, which still exists to this very day. Our legacy, to my mind, does not go back only to Sir Milo and Lady Caroline. But our legacy goes further back to my grandmother, Frances, and her husband, George. And it goes back further than that to George's father, who was Israel. And it goes beyond that to Israel's father, who was Milo. The old Milo Butler, we are inclined to call him. That good gentleman was in business and apparently ran a pretty decent business. Right? I mean, to the point that he was exporting um, products that he grew out of Eleusera and Rumkey, he was exporting them to Europe. So when I look back and see exactly our tie to the business, I must say, it's no accident. I mean, and you wonder where the genes come from or how did you get there? And perhaps that is part of how we got where we are and why I am comfortable doing the business that we are doing. I remember in my role as chairman of junior achievement, when we were doing research as to what were the, who were the individuals who had gone above and beyond shaping the modern Bahamas as we know it today? Our research showed that Samalo Butler was worthy of inclusion in a group of 10 that included people like Sir Stafford Sands and E.P. Taylor, Lyford Key, and the Ericsons from Inagua. 
um, and Wallace Gross from Freeport and Warren Tripp from Illusio. These are the people who really up and beyond the realm of um, the ordinary help to shape the modern Bahamas. Here is Samalo, whose contribution is generally seen in the political and social arena, where he's also being recognized as one of the architects of the economy. Now, that's a, that makes him a very rare, rare breed, and it's an aspect of his life that is often overlooked. Now, in that regard, there's one thing that I think is particularly worthy of note. The fact that he built a business, Mallow Butler and Sons, an organization, and he built that strong enough that it survives today, and it survives um, with the family still in control of it, a son running it. I mean, that is a wonderful model for all Bahamian families with a business orientation to follow. I mean, it, it's just a wonderful legacy if you really think about it. The Rockefellers in America became the Rockefellers, for example, because they survived more than one generation. Um, the Kennedys, all the great families in developed countries become great because, not just because there was a great patriarch, or matriarch as the case may be, but that patriarch or matriarch was strong enough to build a sufficient of a structure within the family that it could survive his or her passing. And Samalo has done that. In the 1930s, Sir Milo got involved in politics, a time when the Bahamas was quite different from what it is today. Things that today we take for granted, people of his generation could not even imagine. Racism was rampant, and black Bahamians were second-class citizens. What I think this generation ought to know is that Things were not always as they happen to be presently in the country. Uh, racial discrimination, uh, segregation, uh, the suppression of secondary education, all of that were obstacles that had to be overcome for us to reach uh, the stage that we eventually attained in 67 when majority rule came. It is difficult to explain to young people what we had to live through during that period. And the overriding problem of that period was, of course, racism. We lived in a society where racism was the order of the day. I went to the governor's high school, and there's a place called Black's Candy Kitchen where I used to, we used to get our lunch. They served the black ones out from the, from the window, and the white ones can go inside and eat. There were places where, as a black man, I couldn't go. Um, theaters, uh, restaurants, and the hotels. In terms of employment, there were few choices. You either worked for the government or the Bay Street merchants. These persons not only controlled the economic power, but also the political power. And there was no such thing as a secret ballot. The vast majority of those who were employed um, worked either in the civil service for the government, which was controlled as was the economy also by the Bay Street Boys, who after 56 became formalized as the United Bahamian Party. Uh, you either worked for the government or you worked for some enterprise that was owned or controlled by them. Uh, it must be realized also that the secret ballot only came into play in 1949. In 1949, prior to that, all the elections, including the elections in 1942, there was open ballot, open voting. And you can imagine the intimidation factor that came into play when you went to the polls to vote and the candidates were your employer. That's how it was up to 1949. They wanted total control of the country, which they had the economic lifeblood of the country. They decided who could get into business, who could open a shop, who could sell liquor, 
who could do this and who could do the next thing. And so it was, it was a classic oligarchy. That was life, and the people believed in it. This is, this is what I found. They believed, um, they believed that it was good. Discrimination was good for the country, because that's what we were told. We were told, for instance, and this was the propaganda at the time, I call it propaganda, but this was put out, that if we insist on going into hotels, we need a fair with the tourist industry. And then on my way, I'm now an uh, 18 year old thereabouts, going, going away to, to England, on a boat called the Araguane, um, heading for Bristol in England. And on that, on that boat was um, um, some representative from the Caribbean who were trying to see if they can salvage the, the political union at the time among the Caribbean countries. And among them was a judge from Nigeria, called, and I remember his name, Mr. Justice Rhodes. He's a black Nigerian. You see, he was a puny judge. Well, I, thought, I didn't know anything about what a puny judge was. I told him I was a tiny judge. Well, so they looked at him. He says he's a puny judge. He didn't look so puny to me. So um, he says, where are you from? I was, oh, I was smart. I was out from the Bahamas. Well, like I see frown. He says, boy, that's a terrible place. He was on a cruise. And um, he says, um, the cruise ship stopped here. And he said, I'm tired, there's food on the, on the, on the, on the um, boat. I want, I want to um, see and get some native food. So he goes straight to the restaurant and tell him, we don't serve you here, you people here. That's what they told him. Um, so he goes around and he goes to another one and they tell him the same thing. He says, the heck with it. He says, um, anyway, let me get a haircut because um, they can't cut my kind of hair on the, sh on the ship. So he goes to this barber shop. He says, as so, soon as the rich fellow says, you know, if you come for a haircut, we cannot cut your kind of hair. So he says to the fellow, you got the same kind of hair that I got. Why can't you cut it? He says, you hear what I say? We don't cut it in here. Anyway, he says, feet insulted. He says to wife, you know he's going, but let's go in a cinema and waste time. Of course, he went into the cinema. And um, of course, you know, they chucked chuck him out to tell him you can't come in here. And he said, that was experience. He says he will never come to the Bahamas again. I then thought, I said, well, you know something? I think this fellow is right. I didn't understand. I didn't know he was right all this time. In 1956, Samilo joined the PLP and continued working on behalf of his people. He never sought leadership but worked with those younger men like Lyndon Pinling and Arthur Hanna for the rights of black Bahamians. He was considered a father figure and the ultimate team player. By the end of the 50s, things began to move because there was demonstration. We would go into, go into a restaurant and we sit down and we take up as many seats as we can so they, they can't get any business. And then we have some fellas outside telling, telling the people who come, it looks like they come in, don't go in there. So, um, several people um, have been reported having food poisoning or things like that, you know. So um, that restaurant, we, we got rid of that one. Yeah, they, they decided that um, their, their ways of wickedness was at an end. And um, <clears throat> things like that. And finally, it came to a head because the PLP, it came to a head where the, where the, because the PLP is growing in numbers now. In those years, 1956 to 1962 and on until 1967, um, the Bahamas was clearly in transition and uh, great movements were afoot and the masses the great the masses of the people the black people of this country were awakening they were awakening they were awakening to the fact that they had been in a back position for 
for centuries and and that they'd inherited they had inherited this status from their forefathers they were becoming alive to that and realizing that they had to do something about it in 1956 Samaila was that voice out there shouting above everybody else's and I could vividly remember um, at that time they had rules uh, for the parliamentarians speaking for the length of time that they could speak they had uh, so Ace Pritchard was then the speaker of the house and so Asa had an hourglass on his desk because Samilo always spoke long he was always concerned about the straw vendors and their welfare. Um, in the House of Assembly, after, um, you know, when they were having a hard time with the um, governing party and the, the, we were in opposition, whenever there was something afoot in the House, um, we would be advised that something was going on and we should um, see what's going on and we should go over there, we meaning the straw vendors. So we would go over there in a group and stand around to see what was going to happen. And the first time uh, Smile was asked to sit down, he told them that he has a lot to say for the people and about the people and he was not about to sit down. Well, that happened on many occasions, and Samila refused. I mean, listen, he was about to jump over that desk if he was able to get at that man. He says, I just don't like, I don't hate the white man. It's just that I hate his ways. And he will not sit down because the people of Bain Town sent me here. And so this particular day, I think Sir Asa was fed up to his teeth, and he said, either you sit or I will name you. And Samilo said, well, you're going to have to name me. And they named Samilo. At that point, when I finally understood what was really happening, I dashed out of the House of Assembly. The straw vendors were, I think they were placed at Rossum Square. And I ran out of the House of Assembly and I told the ladies, shouting at the top of my voice, they're about to throw Mr. Butler out of the House of Assembly, y'all come. And she said that every all the straw vendors dropped what they were doing and they ran across the street. By the time I got back to the House of Assembly, uh, they actually named Samilo. And because he would not sit down, they had two big policemen lifted Mr. Butler bodily out of his chair. I think they brought a chair down to him. I think Samilo just refused to let go of the chair. And by the time we got downstairs, and you know, Mr. Butler was a big man, and so they had a problem getting him down those narrow, that narrow that stairway. The House of Assembly was surrounded with people. And of course, my aunt, Eula, the one that took care of the children, she was in the forefront. And she rushed up to the police, but by that time, um, the policemen were coming down with him from upstairs. And they were outside with him, and when she got there, they were just about to put him down, and she walked, she used to stammer. So she walked up to the police, she say, uh, 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 rest him down easy. If they don't let him drop, rest him down easy. <laughs> Between 1956 and 1962, the PLP continued to grow in numbers and in momentum. Sir Jeffrey Johnstone recounts his introduction to Samilo during this period. 1962. Um, when I was elected to Parliament, I think that was probably, I'd be more accurate to say that was my earliest recollection of, of Samilo. I was running as a candidate for the House of Assembly. So was Samilo. He was larger than life. He was larger than life just to look at, but he was larger than life in, in, um, in his whole makeup and in his whole character. And, and of course, he was a crusader. Uh, for his cause. Great speaker, a marvelous rabble rouser. I don't mean that in a, in a, contempt, in a con contemptuous sense, but he was able to, to uh, arouse a crowd uh, with his, um, 
His homespun oratory. Uh, he drew big audiences. Uh, they were very, that was a very tumultuous election. He was in the forefront of, of uh, the, the, political, uh, the political awakening of the Bahamas. And uh, he, he was his own pioneer before, before Mr. Penling got into it and a lot of other people. Following 30 years of opposition politics, on January 10th, 1967, Somila Butler and his party, the PLP, with the cooperation of Sir Alvin Brennan and Sir Randall Fox, became the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. From 1967 to 1973, Somalo served in the cabinet as Minister of Health and Welfare, Minister of Labor, Agriculture and Fisheries. On August 1st, 1973, Somalo was sworn in as the first Bahamian Governor General. He was knighted in the Queen's birthday honors of 1973 and made a Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of St. Michael and St. George. Queen Elizabeth II, he was again honored and made a Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order. Following a lengthy illness, on January 22nd, 1979, the nation mourned the passing of its hero. Throughout his life, this veteran, visionary politician, this freedom fighter, this courageous leader, left a lasting impression on all who came into contact with him. Grindaddy and I always loved being together. He, every afternoon, after I would get home from school, at, from, at government house, I would go and sit in his office. So time spent, he would just, I would be in his office with him dialoguing with him, asking him questions about certain things in the government, as little as I knew then at that time, as I was able to put together. But just sort of just watching him and moving around with him. The other times I do remember with him is on Saturdays, he always made it a point to take me some point, some place that was historic. Fort Charlotte, Fort Montague, and so on. So I really would get a really good view of what the forts meant and all the different things and what happened there and so I knew where they were and all the rest of it he tried to make much of my life experience as historic as he possibly could so he spent a lot of time taking me there then there was always going out to the docks every afternoon Monday through Friday we would go for an afternoon drive and he would take us out to the docks and I was always pleased to hear that people calling him daddy and daddy but never understood what it meant come to realize later on as I grew older and began to read and from dialoguing with my cousins and older cousins and uncles and aunts, I began to understand what all of this meant as to why they would call him daddy, persons in the dark and so on because of the times, the type of things that he did to help them. Inside the House of Assembly, he was considered a bulldog as he worked tirelessly for his people and was never afraid to confront issues that adversely affected them. But outside the house, he was a different person, speaking barely above a whisper and a gentleman. Samilo was a Christian gentleman who was not ashamed to display outward signs of his Christianity and to ensure that his family members learned good Christian values. Church attendance and Bible knowledge were part of his daily routine. Samila was a member of the vestry, was a regular worshiper um, in church every Sunday and um, every day during the week as he 
came from town, he would stop in the parish around midday and pray for a half an hour more just um, by himself. And Samilo was not only a very active member of the parish of St. Matthew's, but he was for many years a member of our diocesan synod and made his contribution to the wider Anglican family here in New Providence and in the family islands. Particularly, he supported the re-entrance of the diocese into the field of education with the um, foundation of St. John's College and then later with the coming into being of St. Anne's High School because he was a great supporter of education for all the people, um, not only for those who could afford it, but for the wider community. Whenever we visited his home, and I recall this at the age of about eight, nine, we were called upon to recite the Psalms. And so I was taught at an early age to recite Psalm 1, Psalm 27, Psalm 23. Oh, I can't remember. We went on and on every Sunday from about 3 in the afternoon through until 5. We sat at Uncle Milo's knees, as it were, and we memorized Psalms. And that was not just his children. It included his sister's children, that's Jane, his other sister, Elise, who has two children, and anyone in the neighborhood who he could catch in order to make sure that they learned their Bible. Sundays was a special day in that, uh, sort of being good Anglicans, we always had to go to, go to Mass and go to Sunday school and, and go to afternoon Sunday school, and, uh, and the adults would go to the, the church in the night. St. Matthew's, we were done everything, christened there and everything else. Yeah. I was a Sunday school teacher. So and Charlotte, these were our people, right, our cousins, right in the yard. We all went together, and we lived together. And after Sunday school, they'll come to us, and we'll have our dinner because we were one family. He involved his family and all the um, well, first of all, in uh, as a church group and um, in his businesses. Um, Milo B. Butler and Sons. And today, his legacy is carried on by um, his sons and daughter who uphold that same tradition, that consciousness of um, service to God and service to their fellow human beings. He was a generous man and encouraged people to save. Many people benefited from his generosity, including family islanders, straw vendors, contract workers, persons in hospital, and anyone trying to get ahead. He wanted to make a better way of life for his people and did all he could to ensure it. He was a man of impeccable character, and so he was well trusted throughout the Bahama Islands. Samilo was a very generous person, generous with his time, his abilities, and his finances. And he would support the activities of the parish um, in any way that he was called upon and uh, he supported many of his needy brothers and sisters by assisting them financially and um, materially. He was a helpful person. He was not just interested in himself and his family. He was concerned about the Bahamian people, the masses. The straw vendors can tell you about his personality and his generosity, because he initiated for them, or I should say for us, because I'm one of them, he initiated 
a savings plan for Christmas. And he would come around every day and collect whatever you had, however small, he would collect it, take your name, put down the amount. And at Christmas time, you had some money to look forward to. When the British Colonial was built uh, and was operating, and the Victoria, which were the kind of older hotels, one of the things that he did, he recognized that um, these family island um, farmers who had livestock as well as their produce that they grew, uh, quite often would ship them down and really not get a market. He established himself as a reliable person, and people more and more got to know about him, and they recognized that they sent him their products, whether they were livestock or whether they were the um, farm type, uh, the agricultural stuff. They would um, uh, be sure to get their money. And so he established himself from the very early days of being a person of integrity. Uh, he became to be more um, well known and the project continued to grow. That is the fellows that used to go to um, Florida and the United States to do farming. Uh, we used to call it on the contract or on the project. Uh, a lot of those people would kind of ask him to please collect their funds for them and hold it or give it to their so much to their wife or whatever so when they came home they could have their funds i mean and he was really to my mind really really very um reliable i mean and people felt good they knew that if they left a hundred dollars or he collected a hundred dollars for them they could rest assured that they can get a hundred dollars for many years Samaro visited the wards of the then Bahamas General Hospital and later um, Princess Margaret. And uh, as he visited the wards, not only praying with the sick, but would share um, s some of his finances with the needy ones in hospital. When we get there, the nurses will say, well, now, man, got to let these get some time. And then we'll have the packages and put some on different places and find out what they could eat and what they don't like. We would make little bags and packages. We did that. The first time that I really dealt with them one-on-one, -on -one, I, I was buying a piece of property. And um, I wanted to pay for it so that I could have the title deeds in hand. And I went to him and I asked him um, if he would help me to f complete payment for this property. So he said, yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'll, I'll help you. And he helped me to pay for this property. Many of us, me and my family and I benefited from Samilo's generosity during those days when we were sort of hand to mouth because the struggle was the important thing for us. So Samilo helped people individually, and he also helped the movement. He put his, not only his mouth, but his money into the movement. Samilo, in so many ways, um, gave that example of a deeply Christian individual on fire for the rights and privileges of all people, regardless of race, color, or creed. And one who not only uh, demanded of others, was willing to share with um, others through his, from his own pocket. This Christian and civic commitment was no doubt the result of the home environment in which he grew up. His mother, Frances Butler, née Thompson, was a Christian woman, was a member of the Bahamas branch of the London chapter of the Queen Mary Needlework Guild, the improved, benevolent, and protective order of Elks of the world, 
and the Order of the Eastern Star Fraternal Organization. She is recognized as a pioneer in social work in the Bahamas, and together with Mrs. Violet Chase, Mrs. Blanche Thurston, and Mrs. U.J. Mortimer, established the Mother's Club of the Bahamas. She was also responsible for the formation of the Young Women's Christian Association, the Young Men's Christian Association, and the Silver Bells. Most persons will remember his mother, Mother Frances Butler, who was a deeply Christian lady too, with a great social conscience, who cared for the needy, and um, I was one of the founders of the Mother's Club. Yeah, sometimes we go in Malcolm's Park, sometimes we do the food in the house, and they you know, make themselves happy by the park and then in the house and all like that. What were the lessons learned from this outstanding son of the Bahamas and national patriarch? What was his legacy? Be humble. Keep your feet on the ground. Don't get too high and mighty, because if you get high and turn it, uh, turning your nose up, remember now, the fellas that you hit on the way up, you pass them on the way down too. So you really need to be have a sense of who you are. Um, there were so many lessons that I learned from him, but yes, I think um, to know who I am, to be able to live with me um, and to realize that I am a child of God. One thing he always said to me was, Alan, be a leader and not a follower. Make sure you are a leader and not a follower. And let God always be your guide. Samilo mingled with kings but never lost the common touch. He was a genuine patriot of his own cause, his people's cause. A giant of a man, not only in stature, but in thoughts, in words, in concern, in care, in love for the Bahamian people. The man of God and a man of his people. Fine gentlemen. May his soul rest in peace. Sir Milo Butler was a man born for his time, a time when the majority of Bahamians were ruled by the minority, a time when black Bahamians needed to be delivered from degradation and oppression. Since the 1930s, he was that voice crying in the wilderness, as it were, as he fought for equality for all Bahamians. And although there were times when he suffered because of his views, with his strong belief and faith in God, he never wavered. He was determined to make a difference and always rose to the occasion. He used the Bible as his guide and over the course of his life, helped change the political and social landscape of the Bahamas. Samalo also influenced the economic landscape and his legacy of Milo Butler and Sons serves as a model for successful Bahamian family businesses. Samilo was a man who was totally committed. He gave his all to his God and to his country, especially to the underprivileged. And for this, he earned the respect and admiration of the Bahamian people. Words like good, consistent, humble, hardworking, Christian, dedicated, friendly, generous, gentleman, are just some of the words that have been used to describe Samilo. As we continue to build our Bahamas, our challenge is to produce future generations of men and women like Samilo, 
with strong Christian values, to work hard, and to put people above self. Samilo's legacy was no doubt his total commitment to the advancement of the Bahamian people. Samilo Fountain Butler, a national hero. Born in 1906, this country, I'm